putting up on YouTube in the next couple of days. There we go. Welcome everyone to our October Geography Matters session. This Tonight we are hearing a fascinating presentation around reconciliation in Australian conservation, emergence of cross-cultural approaches in ecology and environmental management. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are meeting uh, this evening, in a multitude of places. For myself here in inner city Brisbane, that is the Yagara and Turrbal peoples, and recognise their connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So tonight we are joined by Amelia Enns and Ishara Sahara to discuss with us reconciliation in Australian conservation. And we'll be diving into how conservation practice has quietly gained pace from the most remote regions to our urban centres in its interaction with reconciliation. I won't take any more thunder though from our presenters and we will give a brief overview of both of them very shortly. Just before that though, I would like to make a very quick plug for a few other upcoming RGSQ events. Uh, this Thursday night, both in person and on Zoom, we have the next in our professionals talk series where we've lined up some fantastic speakers from uh, Southeast Queensland to talk about their work engaging the community and school students with geography, including a presentation from the uh, Australian Geography Competition, uh, a partnership of RGSQ and the Australian Geography Teachers Association, uh, discussions about geography education from Nick Law, and some presentations from a community engagement officer with Brisbane City Council. So registrations are still open. Please sign up for that, both in person and online. Uh, likewise, our Geography in Conversation series at the end of each month uh, is being held on the 24th of October uh, in person in uh, Brisbane. And we'll be talking about the Blue Heart Project up in the Sunshine Coast and carbon sequestration and restoration projects like it. Nonetheless, though, let's dive into our discussion for tonight. And I'll start by introducing actor, acting professor Amelia Enns, who is a cross-cultural ecologist in the School of Natural Sciences at Macquarie University. Amelia has been mentored by and collaborated with many knowledgeable and generous elders and rangers. Over the past 15 years, she's had, has continued to build these relationships and has developed new cross-cultural approaches to better understand and manage relation, uh, country and environmental impacts and change. She and her vibrant cross-cultural ecology lab uh, work with multi-generational and multilingual groups on site-specific projects in Arnhem Land, Northern New South Wales and the Sydney region, as well as a large scale regional and national collaborative projects. The teams work on a range of topics from invasive species to fire, climate change, wetlands, coast, biodiversity, language and cultural knowledge documentation and higher education transformation. Uh, her work combines Western ecology tools with knowledge techniques and priorities of her Aboriginal colleagues in an attempt to produce ethical and socio-ecological just approaches to conservation. She's passionate about documenting this work and similar work of others and advocating for increased awareness and uptake of multidisciplinary methods and mutual benefits in research. Our interviewer for tonight is Ashara Sahama, uh, who is a human geographer who's focused on systemic changes through community engagement, social, social justice advocacy, and holistic impact measurement. Uh, Shara is passionate about co-designing experiences, programs or systems that leave a positive and lasting impact on community and the environment and works in an environment with researchers skilled at transforming human emotions and socio-cultural motivations into tangible outcomes that they can easily evaluate for its impact. And she's currently a co-founder of a startup, uh, which she might give us some more details about a bit later. Nonetheless, though, we'll dive into the presentation component. It's all yours, Amelia. Yeah, so now I'm off mute. Hi, everybody. How are you going? My name's Amelia Renz, um, Associate Professor, not acting. That's fine. I kind of act a bit sometimes as well. Hope I don't, I don't act up too much tonight. Um, yeah, so today, thanks for the introduction. Um, already had a great introduction to the title of my talk. Um, so I'd like to, oops, hold on if the presentation will work. Um, First, post a bit of a warning to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples um, who are here with us today. This presentation does contain images of people who have passed away. Um, also, I want to acknowledge um, the country that I'm sitting on tonight at home. Um, I'm on Gamaragal land in northern Sydney. Um, 
and I would like to pay my respect to elders past, present and future of this land and also acknowledge um, the many First Nations custodians who I've worked with and learned so much from um, across the last 15 years, um, including the Wandarang, Mara, Aloha, Gunea, Gunwingu, Amangarai um, in Arnhem Land and Barbaram up near Cairns, my mate Jerry Turpin, not sure if you're here today, but big shout out to Jerry. Um, Bundjalung and Bandulang groups from northern New South Wales and more recently um, the Darug down here in Sydney and Macquarie Uni where I'm usually working. Um, so Australian reconciliation in conservation. I thought we'd just start and just pause on these two key words that we have here in the, the title of this talk, um, reconciliation and conservation. Um, they can be quite controversial terms and confusing terms, so it's good to sort of pause and just think about what they mean and what they mean to me as I go through this talk. So from the reconciliation, um, I'm talking about an end to disagreement and the start of a good relationship and the process of making it possible for two different ideas to exist together without being opposed to each other. Um, I've taken these from the Oxford Dictionary, by the way. Um, conservation, we're talking about, as we all would know, protection of the natural environment, as well as that of protection of buildings that have historical artistic importance, and I'd argue not just buildings, um, thanks Oxford Dictionary, but also um, heritage, cultural heritage, including tangible and intangible elements. Um, the third um, definition of conservation could also be the act of preventing something from being lost, wasted, damaged or destroyed. So the vision that, um, that I and many people have for reconciliation and conservation, therefore, would be to make an end to the disagreement, to create good relationships and bring different ideas together to protect Australian environments and cultures, to prevent them from being lost, damaged or destroyed. Um, we also want to enact restoration of environments and cultures, acknowledging that um, so many have already been damaged and destroyed, and hopefully not lost, and we can work towards recovering some of these. Um, and this sort of vision and the concept is very much in line with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People um, as an international policy directive, um, as well as many other international policies as well, as, as well as the national um, policies that, that direct us to work better with Indigenous peoples um, in conservation, and elevate their voice in decision making. Um, so this sort of suggests to me that we need to we um, balance Western and Indigenous ways um, of doing things. Um, however, in practice, um, as I've come to um, learn firsthand, this is, um, can be very difficult con to control, um, balancing um, both ways, especially me being a non-Indigenous person, um, and can and sometimes must flip from one way to another. Um, so, for example, when making decisions about digging in a certain area on Aboriginal land, um, clearly this must be under Indigenous control. So the power shift is going to shift towards in, um, Indigenous peoples um, to getting reports into government funders on time. Sometimes we might need to shift to sort of Western control to push to get some of these things done and using, uh, you know, modern, modern tools and technologies. So these swings up and down, um, shifting from Western to Indigenous ways in practice in, um, in cross-cultural sort of work um, are normal. But at the end of the day, you know, for um, ethical interactions in this cross-cultural context that we all live in, that's the reality of the world that we live in, we nearly really do need to start to strive for a better balance between Western and, and Indigenous control. Um, because you know, all too often we know over the last 235 years since European colonisation of Australia, um, a lot of the decision making about what happens on this continent has been conducted by Western or European or Euro-American um, voices and people. Um, so, um, uh, let me just move this little thing here up. I can't see properly what's going on. Um, hey. So to shift um, Western control and empower Indigenous leadership, we need to sort of swing the balance back um, towards more Indigenous leadership in science. Um, I started thinking about this spectrum of um, what, what usually is um, public participation in science from the IAP2 um, spectrum, of public participation in science. 
and thinking that we could adopt this in the Indigenous engagement sort of space um, where we can move from um, informing Indigenous people to consulting, involving and collaborating towards empowering Indigenous people um, to take a, a greater leadership role in, in conservation and hear their, have their voice heard so we start to tip the balance. Um, and in practice, some examples of what this kind of um, looks like is from sort of just informing um, Indigenous peoples in, with regard to conservation. We can sort of acknowledge traditional owners towards consulting, requesting access to, to country, um, to participation, collaboration, and then towards co-designed sort of projects, and then hopefully moving towards more Indigenous-led um, conservation in Australia. You know, I must acknowledge there are some fantastic Indigenous scientists in Australia. Um, however, we know that we need a lot more and we have a, a serious underrepresentation of Indigenous people in um, science and higher education and science, um, conservation generally as well. Uh, so three reasons why um, I'm just going to touch on that we can't um, carry on Three reasons why we can't carry on business as usual in Australian conservation. I'm probably um, sort of preaching to the converted here, it, it may be, um, but, but just a reminder that there are you know, many reasons why we need to start to shift this decision making. Um, the first well, one being that um, we have had 235 years of environmental decline in Australia under European colonisation and hegemony or control. Um, we need to support First Nations um, people's rights to practice culture, to make decisions about their land, um, to practice um, their traditional languages and engage effectively in decision making. Um, the third reason um, is also the, considering the, the re recognition of Aboriginal land ownership um, that we're seeing here in, in Australia. So, this figure here on the right from my old boss, Professor John Altman. Um, shows that in 1788, all of Australia was Aboriginal owned and managed and cared for, moving towards you know the, the white Australia sort of policy when total um, control was assumed by um, European colonisers or settlers. And then um, gradually after that, from 1976, moving towards 1993, when um, the Native Title Act was established and into more recent times, We've seen um, increasing re, um, return of country to Aboriginal people's ownership and control and decision making. So these are really three key reasons why I think we need to start to um, think more about these cross-cultural approaches in ecology and environmental management. And we can consider this reconciliation in conservation. Okay, so it's kind of simple sort of principle we're talking about here. Um, combining Indigenous knowledge and Western science, even though, as I alluded to earlier, it's not always that simple in practice and there's sort of temporal and spatial shifts. But essentially um, what we're talking about is bringing together Western scientific um, knowledge and techniques and values with Indigenous um, knowledge, techniques and values to enhance our environmental management and try and um, reverse some of the environmental um, and cultural damage that has occurred on this country. Um, now, I must also acknowledge that I'm not obviously the only one doing this. There's many people who have, who have been working on cross-cultural approaches here in Australia well before my time and around me all the time as well. And this growth in sort of cross-cultural approaches and Indigenous um, control in Australian conservation is probably best reflected by um, this, the status of the Indigenous protected areas in Australia, where we can see from 1997 up until sort of the present day, um, we've seen increasing declaration of Indigenous protected areas um, across the country. Um, and this is sort of the state of um, play today. Um, in Australia, we can see this map here, um, shows the Indigenous protected areas in red, the, de the dedicated um, protected areas have already been declared, um, as well as some of the, the ranger groups in blue and the green dots um, illustrate where the, the IPA consultation projects are currently occurring. So you can see um, the, 
massive um, chunks of Australian land that are um, regarded as Indigenous protected areas and managed for natural and cultural purposes by um, Indigenous traditional owners and ranger groups. Um, you might see there are some significant gaps here in the map. Um, one state in particular seems to have quite a large space with no colour. Um, so it looks like Queensland has a little bit of work to do. Uh, oh, I popped that out just so you can see that better. <laughs> um, okay, we've been talking a little bit about countries so far um, and the return of country to Aboriginal control, which is, which is awesome. Um, and that's a whole story. You can probably do a whole sort of talk about that one. But we'll move along to um, recognition of Indigenous knowledge as well, because I think this might be actually one sort of part of, you know, Indigenous empowerment that is often overlooked. We're, we often talk about Indigenous inclusion and acknowledging country and Aboriginal land ownership. But what about bringing Indigenous knowledge into conservation decision making and Indigenous values and priorities? This seems to take a back seat quite often um, on the ground from what I've seen. So in 2015, myself and some colleagues, in, including Jerry Turpin um, from Queensland Tropical Herbarium up near Cairns, um, we, we conducted a review of documented Indigenous bicultural knowledge in Australia, which showed where the hot spots of Indigenous knowledge documentation were occurring. You can see, again, a sort of mimic where the Indigenous protected areas are and clear gaps in the sort of sheep and wheat belt well, belts of Australia in southwestern WA over in Queensland, western New South Wales and into South Australia. Um, if we look at the authorship, this also tells us an interesting story. Um, so um, this, the cumulative frequency through time of these, these documents that we found, over 1,500 um, records, there was a, quite a significant uptick from the 1960s, 70s and 80s. You can see that, you know, exponential increase there um, and all authors, okay, but what about Indigenous um, authorship is lagging far, far behind and this is where we need to also reconcile some of some of this, these issues um, and, and recognise Indigenous authorship and intellectual property rights um, in, in these uh, pieces of literature. Um, so moving on from this sort of introduction into some more um, concrete sort of examples of stuff that I've been doing with my lab and um, students and other colleagues in the Northern Territory. So we've been pretty busy, um, as John sort of prefaced earlier, and I'll just talk to you about two sort of um, long-standing research programs that I've been engaged in um, with some ranger groups in Arnhem Land. Um, the first program is around um, the impact of feral ungulates on wetlands. Um, including the ecological, human, carbon and cultural impacts. And the second research program um, is around the cross-cultural fauna research, where we're um, working to build the baseline knowledge of fauna, um, threatened species and culturally significant species in Arnhem Land. So moving to this first example, um, some of the research, the cross-cultural ecological research we've done um, to better understand the impacts of feral ungulates, being pigs and buffalo and horse in East Arnhem Land, um, and their impacts on wetlands. So this is work we've been doing since 2008, 15 years, um, some long-term monitoring of ground-based features, um, water quality, cultural values, and Indigenous perceptions and values of, of these impacts, and raising community awareness of some of um, the threats to country that are occurring from these hard hooved animals. Um, I've, yeah, we've also attracted a, a bit of media around some of these this research, um, including you can see here with my um, my long standing colleague and mentor, Mrs. Cherry Willoughby Daniels, um, who passed away, but was really instrumental to providing a lot of energy for this research and teaching me so much about how we can balance Indigenous and Western ways of doing and, and being. Um, in 2016, uh, myself and Cherry and, and the Rangers were joined by Shana Russell um, and she did her PhD um, in Southeast Arnhem Land with the Young Bala Project and Little Monkey Rangers. 
looking at the human health and cultural impacts of ungulates as well. So we're not just, even though, you know, I have a, a classical sort of ec ecological science background, um, it was, I guess, the interests of the, my Aboriginal colleagues in Arnhem Land that has encouraged me to to branch out of sort of ecological science and start to to bring in the human health, the human dimensions, um, the cultural dimensions of these um, environmental challenges that we're facing in this part of the world. Um, you can see here one of our young colleagues, Christy Rami, showing um, some of the water water quality issues that we face and some very um, uh, interesting photos there over on the right, showing you where the, this dirty water is coming from. Um, yeah, so the, a lot of the work that we've done has really strived to um, involve communities, young people and elders in sharing this knowledge and stories and science um, to build a, a the knowledge base of um, these threats, threats to country and how it can start to manage them. Um, this work in southeast Arnhem Land was sort of expanded up into northeast Arnhem Land, where um, we were joined by Daniel Sloan, PhD student in 2017. Um, and Daniel's been working with the rangers, looking at the impacts of the ungulates on floodplain wetlands, um, where we've been um, trying to disentangle the effects of the, the ungulates and sea level rise on various parts of the, the ecosystem and the cultural values. Um, in 2018, Daniel and the Rangers constructed some feral ungulate exclusion plots, which have proved to be um, very useful um, up in, in the present time, where we've started to look at the carbon sequestration benefits of removing feral ungulates from these systems. Um, and that's where some of our recent work has started to, to focus in on the, these carbon benefits um, of excluding ferals from the floodplains. Um, and hopefully um, we're working with Kath Lovelock and some others from the University in Queens of Queensland and in the Northern Territory um, to work on the, the potential for a new carbon um, abatement market um, around exclusion of feral ungulates from floodplain wetlands and wetlands in the north. Um, so we're not just talking about um, carbon here. Um, in the cross-cultural sort of ecology lab, we're all about um, including the cultural values. So we've been sort of asserting the involvement and inclusion of our Indigenous research um, partners um, in this process of, of this new carbon market and bringing in um, the cultural values. So um, it was, I guess, very fortuitous that we had these exclusion plots established in 2018 has allowed us to sort of um, determine um, these carbon impacts and, and sequestration benefits over the last five years on the floodplain, but also um, the the bush food benefits. So on the floodplain in um, northeast Arnhem Land, where we've been working, we excluded um, pigs from the some rake areas. You can see here on the right, myself, myself and some of the Meow for Women Rangers collecting rake um, out on the floodplain. And what this research showed was um, when ferals are excluded up to five years, there was there was up to a fourfold increase in the, um, the density of rake in the plots. Um, we've been, as we've been doing this work, um, interviewing some of our Indigenous research partners um, to get sort of their take on um, the observations. And here we have a bit of video of um, Juna Wurrungwurra, one of the senior traditional owners of Wurrungwurra homeland, talking a little bit about um, the rake collecting that she and um, others were doing here on the floodplain. So this little bit of video is um, spoken in Yulungamata, but you can hear um, what, she's, what she's talking about. I'll try and translate as we go, go along. So if you say done now, biggest mob there inside the fence. And only a little bit of nut stuff food outside the fence. They were collecting. So it was also hard. Yeah. 
inside the fence. The rake is lush and easy to collect the corms, which is the food that she's holding up there. Hey. Um, so that sort of wraps up the first kind of case study of our cross-cultural research, where you can see we've been combining um, Western scientific techniques with um, Indigenous cultural values and cultural knowledge. Um, the second example is our cross-cultural um, fauna work that we've been doing um, across East Island Land as well. Um, why we started doing this initially um, was that um, some of the, the senior particularly women in Southeast Island land are very concerned about the declining um, fauna of their region, but having very little um, information and data to, to tell them sort of what was going on. And they also um, had been sort of restricted to you know, living in communities and not having um, resources to access more remote parts of their country. So we ended up setting up this cross-cultural fauna research program to build the baseline data in this part of the world um, and um, record and share species knowledge in locally meaningful ways to, to many, many people across the East Island Land region over the last 15 years. Um, in 2016 and 18, we received an Australian Government Citizen Science Grant through the Inspiring Australia program where we really um, yeah, ramped up some of this work. We did 18 um, fauna surveys with um, 316 unique participants, recorded 2,500 species um, in partnership with local Aboriginal communities and really started to build a good picture of where species were occurring, um, the condition um, of threatened species and also culturally significant species. Um, one of the key sort of Western tools that we were using throughout this program was um, a data collection app using CyberTracker that we developed with the rangers to record um, the species observations. So you can see some of those here. And importantly, what we wanted to do was to acknowledge the um, Indigenous collectors of this data and um, I guess, address some of the concerns in the past where um, Indigenous participants in research haven't been acknowledged. It's always the scientists who have got their names in the Atlas of Living Australia and some of these databases. So we created logins for the rangers and some of the Indigenous um, mob there themselves, and they started recording their own um, sightings, which might seem like a small thing, but for them to see their name in these databases alongside the scientists was, was quite empowering. Um, as always, uh, as I've said, we, we always record um, Indigenous cultural knowledge on the camps and any work that we're doing, um, any of the scientific work um, to complement um, the science. And we've got a piece of video here from Banyul Munyarun from Darling Boy in Northeast Arnhem Land. Um, barnul has been an amazing colleague over the years. He's from the, the Wangari clan, a senior cultural leader from that, that region. Um, and he's very passionate about um, better understanding fauna and doing something to manage them in northeast Arnhem Land. And here we can hear Barnell talking a little bit about nick-nick, which are the small native rodents, native mice, and a little bit about their cultural significance and um, how they've learned about them. Yo, Barno. Um, yo, to sort of kind of wrap up now um, and start to reflect on some of these sort of benefits that um, we've seen occur over the, sort of the last 15 years through these, these sorts of programs and what we're starting to call reconciliation through conservation. Uh, 
you know. So we've been building the shared knowledge of environmental values and assets, um, environmental threats, and locally preferred management actions, maintaining um, highly endangered cultural knowledge and language through books and through the, the data collection apps that we've been making that have, are been bilingual. Um, we've been informing land management decision making, particularly around fire, um, using multilingual data recording technologies and outputs, and hopefully inspiring the next generation of all Australians, um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, for collaborative cross-cultural approaches. We won the Eureka Prize for some of our citizen science work, and it was pretty cool that um, some of our work was also featured on Australia Post Stamp. Um, alongside some of these research projects, I'm also very passionate about um, encouraging some remote living Aboriginal students to you know, stay in school and participate in higher education. So in 2018, we set up a bush uni in southeast Arnhem Land um, with some of the elders. You can see Mr Kevin Rogers there in the middle teaching the students. And over the last five years, we've had 100 students enrol um, in the courses that we have out there. Um, where we're now teaching four first-year university subjects and created a pathway for students to continue their higher education and come down to Macquarie Uni if they're keen on doing degrees. So this is some of the stuff we've been doing um, around these sort of research principles that we have, um, that we always do collaborative research. It's very applied with applied focus and management outcomes. Um, we're striving for mutual benefits, so not only for the science and, you know, scientists, but also very much for our Indigenous research partners and communities that we've been very lucky to work with over the last 15 years. Reciprocity is key to this, give and take. Um, it's always place-based. We usually place-based work that we're doing um, in situ. Um, so biocultural restoration, what we're talking about here at the end of the day is action against biocultural homogenization and what some people are calling sort of this wicked problem of the Anthropocene, where we're seeing sort of invasive species and, and also English languages and Western scientific tech, um, tools and techniques starting to sort of um, take, take control and infiltrate over other, other systems. Um, we're really are trying to raise awareness about um, the benefits of combining in ecological and cultural values and priorities in science to abate this homogenization, to address concurrent losses of nature, culture, and language, and produce shared learning and outcomes and solutions um, to make, you know, to restore some of our environments. And you can say, make Australia great again. Um, and that's it. That's me. Thanks for listening. Um, now open for question and discussions. Thank you. That's amazing. Oh, it's really awesome to see the just the extent of the research and the work that you're doing up in Arnhem Land. Um, before we get into questions from the audience, I do have a few questions um, which are weaved a little from questions from the audience as well. Um, but I guess I'm uh, to give the audience a bit of a context of of me as well. Um, I, I'm a human geographer. I do have a very limited experience working with Indigenous groups um, in Queensland um, and they uh, they do have a few ranger programs. Some are either land uh, land based and some are sea based um, but they there is a significant difference in connecting cultural knowledge to scientific knowledge and actually communicating that with local communities. Um, so I wanted to know from your perspective and experiences, what have been any barriers in terms of ranger programs or or indigenous land management where scientific knowledge has never been part of the parlance? And when there's Western land management coming in into, into conversations, have there been any barriers in, in knowledge transfer and, and sharing of cultural knowledge or um, acceptance of Western management? Western management, yeah, all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, um, definitely. Um, I think some of the, the Western sort of tools and programming that I had, you know, as a, as a university student and then, you know, after, um, they just seem really irrelevant 
sometimes when we're out, out in the bush and um yeah, the, we've just got the sort of the priorities maybe mm. all wrong. Like mm -hmm. I guess particularly the example around invasive species, um, you know, down you know, in Sydney where I live, there's a lot of effort to try and, you know, control weeds and invasive species, but for the mob up there, it's it's a different story. Like controlling invasive species is not a simple, simple issue because they have other values. They've got cultural values, they're they meat, um, there's potential for economic income from safari hunting, things like that, from buffalo and pig. Um, so people don't want to just cull. So there is definitely a conflict over um, preferred management solutions for environmental challenges that mm. we come up with, yeah, all the time. That's a, that's a really good example, that one. Yeah. Mm. Would you say there's a, so would, I mean, it's a bit of a generalisation, but there is stark differences between urban versus rural or remote practices, um, particularly around the, the feral feral pigs or ungulates. Um, mm. There's... There's a, there's a lot more up in North Queensland and, and parts of Arnhem Land. How, in your experience, how has that differed from what you've experienced versus in urban versus remote or regional landscapes in terms of attitudes or perspectives towards management? Yeah, it's not, and it's, it's, I guess up in the North, the resources are a lot thinner on the ground. Mm. So... Um, controlling invasives is not, yeah, always a priority because people don't have the resources. They've got other more urgent um, issues, yeah, like, you know, health issues, education, um, just employment. Mm. <laughs> um, take, you know, pe pe front, front and centre in people's mind rather than, you know, controlling ferals or even like the decline of the fauna. Um, people are worried about it. They, you know, they want to do something about it, but they just feel like they don't have any control. They've got um, no means to to do anything about it, which is why we started working on this stuff. Mm. But yeah, there's those sort of differences. Mm. Um, I'm curious to know, and you sort of briefly touched on it in your presentation about recording data collection and recording. Um, I forgot which slide it was but closer to the end of the presentation mm. if you could share a bit more detail around uh, data collection particularly around cultural knowledge how it's recorded how it's preserved um, mm. are there any um, preferences for certain indigenous groups or, or areas where they want it preserved in a different way um, yeah 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 um yeah, no, it's a tricky one. Um, so, for example, with the, the fauna research, I guess is probably the best sort of example where we've been recording um, species observations. Um, the scientific data side of it, um, you know, even that, you know, it's so collaborative and it, it's Indigenous-led. We're going to places that are directed by elders and ranger, ranger groups as their data, their knowledge. Um, um but in, so for the case with the, like, sharing with the Atlas of Living Australia, um, mm -hmm. the ranger groups are very keen to, to share their knowledge and show people sort of what they're doing. Um, if they're um, attributed as the, the collectors of the knowledge, you know, there's, I think there's certain things we can do to, to sort of shift, shift the, um, the focus there. Mm -hmm. That's not me saying, you know, we're, I'm collecting it, but they're collecting it. It's their data. Um, the cultural knowledge is a bit, a bit of a different story, obviously. Um, so Aboriginal people, a lot of the mob, they won't share, like, secret stuff with me or other people. Um, that's never recorded. It's only sort of public knowledge yeah. um, that's that's shared. And um, we specifically do interviews using prior informed consent um, before recording um, any knowledge as well so people know, you know, they've got enough a choice whether it is recorded and how that knowledge would be shared. Um, and quite often, you know, people in Arnhem Land, they're super keen to share their knowledge. They want to share, especially with younger generations. So our work, we've always tried to have um, older older people sharing knowledge with younger people. So they're, they're actually practising their, their, you know, their, their way of sharing and passing on and maintaining knowledge, which is through intergenerational transmission. 
Yep. Um, so we're kind of facilitating traditional processes of knowledge sharing, but recording um, using te modern technology is also really cool for young people. They want to kind of see themselves on video. They want to get behind the computer, do some, you know, video editing of themselves, taking photos and using apps and the tablets and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, so some of the elders lament, you know, that, the young people, they're always always on the phone, like on yeah. their Call of Duty or whatever games and stuff they're playing. It's hard to get them off those devices. So if we can bring the devices into the the conservation space, yeah. um, conserving species and cultures and making it cool and fun, like using those sort of tools, then you know that's one little trick we can use. Yeah, it's effective. Um, yeah, we've recorded so many you know things over the years but very little is in the public space a lot of that those photos and video and data it's held in the, at the ranger group um offices on their computers um you know on people's own computers we've bought i don't know how many computers we've bought for people in you know what i meant <laughs> um on their own laptops and hard drives yeah so it's 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 their knowledge it's for them mm. it's for them to build build their uh, their own sort of databases and um yeah knowledge for decision making and what they want to sort of preserve it's up to them right. yeah we, we are getting um a few questions from the audience as well mm -hmm. i think Anne had asked the first question about uh, feral pigs why are they allowed in the area in the first place <laughs> Oh, you can't stop them. <laughs> just like down in New South Wales, yeah. They're just, I mean, right from the get-go, European colonisation of Sydney. I was reading People of the River by Grace Caskins, amazing book if you're interested in yeah, history of Sydney, um, talking about pigs and how people just let them go in the bush. That's how they farmed them. They didn't have fences back right back in the early colonisation around um, the Hawksley River. So right from the get go, they will let that go in the bush, and you know pigs love Australia. They love wetlands. They love you know, <laughs> they're taking over. They're so hard to cull. They're hard to find. Um, yeah, it's also expensive. You know, it just require a lot of resources to control um, feral pigs in this country. It's a massive issue. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Questions as well. Um, uh -huh. And also asked, do you have any projects in Epping? Epping. <laughs> um, yeah, we're, we're starting um, some work with Durrick on um, the biocultural restoration of yam grounds, mm -hmm. which is a new sort of project that we're going to start. Um, and we're also doing some work with um, Durrick academic Joe Ray down at um, the Lane Cove National Park at Brown's Waterhole. Um, Annie has asked, how does a researcher begin the discussion for collaboration with Indigenous knowledge? Mm, yeah, good question. Um, yeah. How do you begin, begin discussions? Um, I guess just with with humility, um, <laughs> just a genuine sort of desire to sort of collaborate and learn together, um, work together, be prepared to, you know, um, I guess face a lot of questions about, you know, why why you why you want to engage, what you want out of it. And those sort of core principles that I touched on at the end around sort of reciprocity and mutual benefits, um, these are things that we really have to um, think a lot about. So it's not just about us taking, but we also need to give and have that, you know, flow of um, benefits both ways. Um, I think just being persistent maybe. <laughs> Be persistent until you can find the, the right people, you know, who are, who are keen to engage with you. Um, if there's something, you know, if there's something, it's, a, it's human nature. If there's something in it, in it for them, then people are likely to engage. If it's, it's all about us, me, or or you, then why would they engage? Mm. Mm. I think also to add to that, because I come from more of a practitioner side, is um, it's as you said, the the time, um, 
just turning up consistently if you're pursuing a pathway of collaboration um, to build trust. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that anyone will tell you that that will be a process that will be different depending on the group and the language that they speak and, and what matters to them culturally and socially as well. Mm. Yeah, no, definitely time. Yeah. I think uh, there's a big question from Grace. Mm -hmm. Does the Yagiba Study Hub collaborate with a range of providers, um, such as Office of the Chief Scientists um, and, and University of Queensland be running the Flying Scientist Program would there be appetite to invite others or academic volunteers? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, potentially. We're still just trying to, um, with the study hub, um, it's, yeah, it's about yeah, empowering sort of local leadership and um, the local community to, to run the study hub themselves. So we employ 50 local um, remote living Aboriginal people to, to run the hub um, it's, you know, to try and empower sort of community development through education. So we do have sort of non-Indigenous people involved, but not, not that many, I have to say. It's all about sort of empowering local mob. Mm -hmm. um, but we're happy to share yeah, the, the story of the Wegem Study Hub. You can check out the website. Um, and talk to some of the elders there about what they're up to and um, yeah I guess there's there's a lot to learn from this uh, there's there are a lot of other sort of programs like you referred to there the flying scientist program I'm not sure what that is but it sound, sounds good um, there are yeah a lot of programs sort of popping up but yeah it'd be good to have an opportunity to kind of share share the the lessons and the you know the challenges <laughs> so we can make some of these programs stronger in the bush because it's so hard to get these things going in such remote areas the resources the time yeah the relationships the commitment um and just the kind of you know the resilience <laughs> the commitment to sort of pushing through all the challenges mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perhaps if some of our listeners, including Grace, has just asked the question, uh, I've just put in the chat the Cross Cultural Ecology website link. Um, so check that out when you get a moment. And any questions, you, there's a contact page as well there. Um, is there any other questions from the audience? I'll leave it a few minutes, a few, for a few, just for people to gather their thoughts. But I do have a question around future projects um, at the lab. Are there any um, scheduled to start? Sorry? Future projects. Yeah. Any, yeah. <laughs> any updates or anything you'd like to share on what, what's in the works for the near future? Um, yeah, no, I really came to um, get into some sort of biocultural restoration around edible root grounds, so yams and other edible roots. Um, I was really inspired by some some of the Miyup ranges in northeast Arnhem Land um, and one of their mothers who painted 40 different edible root species. Um, prior to that, I thought there was just like one yam that, you know, that people used to eat. But she painted 40 different species and at the time she asked us, uh, us and the rangers to go out and find find these different species and take some photos because she was making a book and that was so difficult to find uh, mainly because of pigs so edible roots are number one yeah food source for pigs invasive you know species so it just yeah got me thinking that you know it'd be a really cool project to do around yeah restoring the cultural values so the edible roots and the knowledge and the, the sort of um, maintenance of the practice of you know collecting them and preparing them and talking about them going out on country and all the well-being benefits as well as storing the, restoring the ecological values around those species themselves bringing them back into the landscape and getting rid of the pigs so this is yeah a project that i'll start working on hopefully soon um, in northeast Island land, but also down in Sydney. Pretty keen to find out what people were eating in the ground down in Sydney. 
and even I don't know in Brisbane in Queensland as well. I think there's probably a few of the the diaspora yams that people used to eat, but yeah, so surprising and yeah, interesting finding all the different species that people used to eat. And we restricting ourselves to like one, you know, white potato, sweet Bloody. potato. <laughs> So many different things we could be eating. Yeah. Our native really species. From a nutritional perspective, what we're mm. actually lacking in our diets, which could be found out in bush. Um, yeah. Yeah. Be yeah. Awesome. That's fascinating. Um, I could just see here, sorry, that someone said there was no sound on which, which video was that one? I think I think there were all the videos. We couldn't hear any sound. You couldn't hear them? No. Oh no. Not even Barnum. Yeah. No. What we can do is we can impose the sound on the video afterwards. Oh, um, someone should have told me I was just standing there quiet then. Oh, that's that's not good. Sorry about that. Mm. Sorry. Um, I haven't got any more questions. Um, so I might hand over to John just to do any last wrap ups. All good. Uh Amelia, so sorry about the uh, video audio, but if you do want to send through, we can try and get that out to everyone after the fact. That sucks. Yeah, okay. Mm. All good. Well, with that, everyone, I hope you've had a lot of fun with tonight's discussion. I know I've certainly learned plenty. Uh, and we'll wrap up from there. Please do check out the RGSQ website for other upcoming events. Uh, and we will be sending out some notices once the recording from tonight is available. Thanks, right. everyone, and hope you have a fantastic night. Thanks, Leanne. Thank See you, you. later. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, thank you.